Hello everyone. We're uh, is up. We're about to start the session. Uh, our speaker is Claudine Chong, and she's going to talk about unlocking the ivory tower. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, in this talk, I'm going to be starting off by talking about uh, Founders and Survivors, which is a project I'm working on at the University of Melbourne, which is a historical database of the convicts who were transported to Tasmania or Van Diemen's Land in the 19th century. I'll then talk about ideas, the, the concept of humanities computing, which is, of which we're an example. That's the use of computers um, in, a, in his historical research and humanities research, research and to a larger scale than simply using desktop applications. Uh, I'll talk about why free and open source software matters to the kind of work that we're doing. Um, that may seem like an obvious question or an obvious answer for, for this group of people, but I'm looking at the particular applications of it in our field and talk about some of the challenges that have come from this sort of work in which I've been doing for about two years. Um, my background is a bit unusual perhaps and that might char characterize a lot of this kind of project. Um, I've always been, had pretty geeky inclinations. I was always one of the kids at school who was hiding behind the computers, but I ended up studying history at university. So it's been a very roundabout way of finally coming to bring some of my interests together. The convict ship, the Claudine, was one of many convict ships which were used to transport people from England to the new colonies of Australia, of New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Claudine made a couple of voyages to Australia. It departed in 18, from 1821 from Woolwich in England and arrived in Hobart in December 1821 after 113 days at sea. 160 male convicts boarded, 159 survived, which is not a bad record for convict ships in this period. Every convict ship had a surgeon and it was customary for the surgeon to keep an official journal record of the voyage which listed not only medical events, uh, things that came under his care, um, deaths of convicts, but also other notable events that occurred during the voyage. Each convict was also recorded in a register which, and we've got an example here from the Claudine for a man named John Astle. This details some, of, some background information on such as where he was born, his trade, the offense for which he was tried, details of the trial and his sentence. It came with the, with the convicts on their ship and when they landed in Hobart, their behavior in, while they were still in the penal colony com continued to be recorded in these registers until they were either pardoned or finished their sentence or reoffended or died. This has, is what some of my colleagues have called a form of a paper database, databases before computers. And what we're interested in doing is trying to convert these into digital databases, taking some of the information that's written here, transcribing it and making it available for searching and browsing by the general public and for analysis, for sharing with other researchers who may be interested in all kinds of research questions. The Archives of Tasmania has an online index of all of the convicts in Tasmania. And we can see here that there's very basic information on the convict and his voyage. And there are links to some of the images of the archival sources, such as the ones that I was showing you. And what we hope to do is expand on the information available by, with the transcriptions and by creating a kind of enhanced version of this index. The Founders and Survivors Project is a collaboration between researchers from the University of Tasmania, University of Melbourne, and 
a few other universities in Australia and England. And our backgrounds come from history, public health, uh, demography, economics, and other related areas. The title refers to the fact that those people who survived their time as convicts, in a sense, went on to found the modern Tasmanian population, or at least the modern white Tasmanian population. The colony of Van Diemen's Land was used as a penal colony between 1803 and 1853, with approximately 13,000 female convicts and 25,000 male convicts. That, those figures include children as well as adults. After various, um, a lot, large number of the non-convict settlers in, in Hobart complained about Hobart being used as a penal colony after protests from these people, transportation ended in 1853 and the state then, the colony then later became known as Tasmania. So in a sense, the name Van Diemen's Land conveniently can be used to refer to this earlier period when, um, when the foundation was very much based on transported convicts. The official uh, information that the data that's been collected by our team has now reached approximately one million rows of data on these 40,000 convicts. That includes some of the quantifiable data, such as the conduct registers that I showed you before, and as well as integrating information from the register of births, deaths, and marriages in Hobart. It also includes more textual or narrative data, such as the surgeons' journals and newspaper reports, which are relevant to convicts but are more like documents rather than database, databases. We've got information from the archives on what happened to the convicts while they were in the penal system, but we're interested in tracing what happened to them after they were freed and the lives of their families and descendants as well. And this is where we're hoping to collaborate with genealogists who have been, and family historians who have been researching their own families, their own convict ancestors. And so a large part of our project is to make links between the official records and the data and the stories that have been collected by family historians who are largely amateurs. This is our vision of the infrastructure for the project. It includes various databases for the different kinds of data and images and other kinds of information that we're tracking. And there will be, there's a web interface which is built on Drupal, which is at an early stage currently, but this will have, as we'll have different kinds of people working on this project from the researchers from the universities, some, also some volunteer researchers from the genealogy community. We're in the process of making contact with people who've done a lot of research either in their own convict ancestors or who have experience in family history and getting them to assist us with jobs such as correct transcribing data or correcting transcriptions. We also have a public interface, which is where I've been doing most of my work in the last year. And that, as well as providing an interface to the data that we've already collected, we're also using that to collect submissions from genealogists on their convict ancestors. Founders and Survivors is one example of a field that's become known as humanities computing or the digital humanities. Now there is, there are historical reasons for these different terms and a bit of a slightly obscure philosophical question on the different connotations of digital humanities or humanities computing or computers and the humanities. I'm not going to get into those 
arguments today, I'll, but through this presentation I'll be referring to humanities computing. And as I see it, what, we're, what this kind of work is about is asking old questions in the humanities using new tools so that we can do things that were either very difficult or impossible before the advent of technology that we have now. And especially in terms of historical research, the main areas that computers can help are in digitizing historical sources, in being able to analyze large amounts of data, and in opening up opportunities for public access and collaboration with other researchers and with members of the public. I'll discuss some notable examples from the last 20 years of humanities computing and maybe give you a sense of the different kinds of application that are possible. The Valley of the Shadow is one of the oldest online historical archives. It is, a, is a, an archive of the American Civil War of the, the period shortly before, during and shortly after the Civil War. And the kind of information that's available here are documents such as personal letters which have been transcribed in a simple HTML interface and also um, images such as an interactive map of different theaters of the Civil War. And I'll, at the end of this presentation, there will be links to all of these projects. Another more recent example is the Old Bailey Online, which is of course of particular interest to, to us who are working with the convicts. This is an archive of the proceedings of London's criminal court between 1674 and 1913. And they're all available on this, the transcriptions of these proceedings are available on this website. They've been processed through XML and as well as the transcriptions we have links to the images, so the page images of the transcript such that it's comparable to what we're doing in Founders and Survivors. And we've also got here a user wiki which allows people to make corrections to transcriptions and to add other information that they may have found in their own research relating to cases or to criminals or other or victims or other people recorded in these proceedings. A different kind of application is a more literary kind of application, and this is another famous, um, famous resource, the Perseus Digital Library of Classical Literature. So what we have here is the first few verses of Virgil's Aeneid. On the left-hand side, the text in Latin, and on the right-hand side, first the, tran the classic translation by John Dryden, and underneath it, a more modern English translation. And at the bottom right hand side there's also links to cross references in other texts which in this instance seem to be mostly um, references from dictionaries and grammars of Latin. And literary and linguistic applications such as Perseus are perhaps more of an uh, obvious or direct connection with uh, computer programming because it's, in a way, it's simply um, analyzing text, processing text, um, and especially using, using hypertext capabilities. And some scholars actually cite the beginning of humanities computing as the Index Domesticus, which was a project that ran over about 30 years, began in 1946. Um, so this was still in the era of IBM mainframes. The Index Domesticus is an archive of the complete works of the theologian Thomas Aquinas. Um, if you're familiar with Aquinas or his legacy, you'll be aware of what a large amount of material that, that is, and I can barely imagine trying to digitize all of that material um, back in the 1940s and 50s. So it is quite a monumental work in the field of humanities computing as well. But what I'm particularly interested in are historical applications of um, large-scale computing. And as I've said before, this, for me, I believe this, the, um, this comes in the areas of 
digitizing sources, of analyzing the data that we get from those sources, and of opening up to collaboration. Digitization of sources, there's dif um, different kinds of sources, such as documents, such as the journals and conduct registers, So, and that could be divided further into more textual or narrative documents and more quantifiable kinds of data. Images are another uh, large category of source, and what computers and databases give us is the ability to make links between documents and make cross-references in our presentation of sources, and this, off, um, this is especially uh, a great opportunity on, on the web. Um, so there's many examples of online or virtual museums that we can find on the web nowadays. Some of the examples of the information that founders and survivors will be hoping to make further use of are such, such as the um, Tasmanian Police Gazette, which can tell us about the fate or activities of convicts after they were freed from their particular sentence. So we have, in, the, in this two-page example, we've got narrative reports from the police department and statistics on crimes and other, other incidents recorded by, by the police and also uh, statistics on paupers or people who were um, kept in institutions or released from institutions. This is another example of a surgeon's journal. So we can see that the structure of these documents varied over time and on, on different voyages. This one's got a bit more structure in it, so it basically has the same information on a chronological record of incidents um, that came under the care of the surgeon of lists of convicts and illnesses and death or recovery and other notable events. This is another example of a conduct register. Again, we can see that there's a slightly different structure here. There's a few tables in the middle um, which provide more guidance for the clerk who was recording this convict. So we've actually got columns in this register for the convict's trade, height, age, physical appearance, uh, as well as family background and, and notes regarding his crime and his offenses. And we can see at the bottom in, of the large section in red that he was freed. And that really marks the end of this official record of this person. So he may reappear in, in the newspaper or he may appear in family histories. But as far as the government and the police are concerned, uh, he's, he's finished. Um, he's no longer under surveillance. So what we're hoping to do is to, to take some of the information from these varied sources and combine them to analyze large amounts of, of data. And this project is at the University of Melbourne. is based in the School of Population Health. And there are various members of the team who are interested in population health and illness and, and death and medical history. So this is an example of what we can do with these combined sources. We've got death rates at sea, which have come from the surgeon's journals, um, which record the illness and death that occur on voyages. And when the convicts land, we then look to the conduct registers for the fate or, of convicts while they were in the penal system. And once they're free, we then have to look at other sources such as government notices and certificates of freedom. Another application of the kind of data that we've got, and one which is, um, which I'm, is pretty new to me, is geographic information. Um, this is not one of our projects, but it's one that we're interested in because 
one of the questions that our researchers are asking is can we make links between convicts who survived the system and their descendants who went on to went on to serve in the First World War and we're interested in whether there might be characteristics of these people and their families relating to resilience and social connections. So we're interested in the Anzacs, the, um, the First World War servicemen and women, as well as the convicts. And as well as being an example of using geographic information and linking up with the Google Maps API, this project, which is a project of the National Archives of Australia, is also an example of um, what I think is a great, one of the great promises of, the, of computers for history is reaching out to the public and making it, making it local and personal and something that people can relate to so that it's not simply about the great men and the great events of the past, but it's about our own stories. Because I, I believe that um, we are or we can all be historians. We all have stories of our own lives and our own families and countries. And this all matters. It's not simply about the big names and the big events. And that's certainly reflected in the way this, this project um, describes the, um, the work that they're doing. There's tools at the, the top to um, find a service person and see their records. So you can search for uh, service people by putting in their name or you can click on a flag which indicates either a town or a collection of places and if you click on a flag you'll get um, you get information about that place and links to service people who were born or lived in that place. You can add a note or images to the scrapbook for each service person and you can build a tribute or write stories or testimonies or um, messages about the people who are important to you so that we, um, well not me personally, but Australians and New Zealanders who have Anzacs in their family history can, can make those connections and make them public and share them with other people. Another example of his collaboration in historical work is another recent project. This, is, this comes from the National Library of Australia and it's an archive of all of the newspapers ever published in Australia. This is an image from the first issue of the Hobart Town Gazette. So in the main image we've got uh, a focus on a specific article in that gazette and on the left hand side a um, scanned OCR text from that image when we're looking at the quality of old newspapers and the variable um, spelling and punctuation in these texts as well as the quality of the paper. There's bound to be plenty of mistakes and we can see, it, you probably can't, can't see from where you are but you'll be able to see it online that this is a pretty, um, there's plenty of mistakes in this text so there are opportunities for people to make corrections and this is in fact I think quite similar to um, the distributed proofreaders project which some of you may know which involves um, collaborative proofreading of texts that go into Project Gutenberg. Now the question of why free and open source software matters to historical or humanities projects um, in a sense that may be a bit obvious to this crowd. Um, we all care about free software, but I'll talk about why it's particularly important for people in the humanities because I think we actually have um, many things, many values that are in common, but to me at least they can seem like two different communities or cultures that don't often come together and don't often talk to each other. And I, especially as I've been trying to get this project off the ground in terms of building the database and putting it on the web, um, what I see as important are the, the, um, the ability to make better use of resources, being able to 
link into a community of developers, being able to use existing tools and adapt them to our needs, making our work and our data accessible to others, and as I've said, a uh, sense of a shared, um, shared values about freedom. The um, use of resources in humanities computing is different from, clearly from, traditional humanities research. Um, the image of, say, the historian as the lone scholar in the library with his or her index cards or laptop is perhaps a bit outdated, but there is humanities research has tended to be very um, individual and also not requiring large amounts of technological capacity. Whereas the sort of project that we're looking at requires huge amounts of computing power, of storage and of bandwidth when we're trying to transfer large amounts of data and large images. And this is something that um, history departments say and project managers and budget man managers in the humanities aren't used to dealing with. So if we're going to be spending so much of our budget on these necessary components, um, free software is, is one way to make better use of that rather than also spending lots of money on software licenses. Um, being able to link to a community of developers is especially important because um, in the humanities clearly there aren't many people who have come from, who, from computer science or people have come into this kind of work through different ways and we can, those of us who are doing the, the uh, development side of pro the project may be quite isolated from other people like ourselves we may be the only technical person on the project, so there's difficulty in getting useful feedback from our colleagues. So it's important to be able to, to link in with other people who may not be doing humanities work, but at least understand our challenges and our needs with the, com with the software and the tools that we're using. And we can see as, as LCA is a great example of the strength of the community in open source. So being able to be a part of this is, is important, I think, for people, for developers in the humanities. And of course, that's also about using existing tools and not trying to reinvent the wheel. And as well as, as using tools, we may need to adapt them because for our particular needs. Uh, one of the, the other developer on our project is interested in, you, in transcribing some of our, our information into a form of XML. For, so for example, there is a form of XML called the Text Encoding Initiative, which was developed for use in more literary or, or documentary resources. So it's a way of marking up literary text and that is quite useful for us, but it's not exactly what we're looking for when we're recording information on people, and so we're interested in, more interested in the people who are recorded in the text rather than the text itself. So that may, it may be that one outcome of this project is a contribution back to the TEI standard to provide a variant of TEI for use in biographical markup. Um, JEDCOM is a somewhat ancient file format used in genealogy. It's, um, it's a real horror to work with. It's, it's quite, um, I think, archaic and not really related to many of the um, file format standards that we use today, but it's used by practically every form of genealogical program. So when we're taking contributions from family historians, they may be submitting JEDCOMs to us, and so we'll, I need to do some work on extracting the information from that so that I can integrate it into our databases, which are based in, S in SQL, MySQL. Free software is also important, um, both as a means and in terms of 
the values of making information accessible, I think that's something that we would all agree with in that perhaps, it, as we may say, information wants to be free. And this, what, what technology gives us the ability to do is to take archival materials so that it's not simply, it's not something that you have to go to a library or, an, or a university or archive to access, but to put it on the web and to make this information available to the general public and also using open file formats to generate data exports that can be used by researchers in other areas. The 40,000 convicts that we've got will be a huge data resource and we, our small team can't possibly think of all the interesting to qu questions to ask about that data so we'll be able to make that available to other researchers who may have completely different questions and hopefully we'll be able to help them answer that. But ultimately for me I think it's really the values that are at the heart of, of why free software matters and why it matters to humanities computing. Um, a lot of academics, especially in the humanities, are motivated by a sense of public interest of somehow contributing to the community. Um, and we value free access and free expression. We also value dialogue and participation across different groups of people. But um, as I have found in this project and in learning and reading about other similar projects, uh, the principles, the ideals of, of dialogue and collaboration are great, but actually putting that into practice can be quite challenging. Um, and I think one way of thinking about these challenges uh, can be uh, as different forms of cultures. Um, so are people here familiar with the concept or the essay um, by C.P. Snow on the two cultures? There's uh, bound to be a few. And I'm sure that there are questions about whether this really applies, but I think there is still some truth to this today. Even though it was, it was written in the 1950s in the context of the Cold War when technology was becoming more of a political, um, political question. And it also originated in England, which has a particular education system that it encourages specialization from a very early age. But I think it can also apply to other modern Western cultures and education systems. And Snow's argument was basically that in the world of academia, there were two cultures, one which he could describe as basically a literary or humanities culture, and another that was more coming out of science and technology. And although academics, um, university professors and students may appear to be similar and have similar le levels of education and social background. There are two cultures that within academia that barely talk to each other or understand each other and in a sense can appear to speak two different languages. Um, I think that we've made some progress in breaking barriers between these cultures but it's still I've found just trying to explain my work both to other geeks and to historians, I find that there, are, that there are a lot of assumptions that you get within the different communities that I have to keep revising and learning to translate into a different community. But apart from this kind of dichotomy, there's other ways in which there are different cultures and different ways of understanding what we do. And especially with a, pro a huge project like Founders and Survivors, I found that there are challenges first between translating between academics from different fields. Um, my background is in history, but I also studied public health, and there's another example of two different cultures. We've also got uh, demographers and economists and geographers on our project, and everybody approaches our project and our data with different priorities and different questions and different ideas of what we can do with this data 
and different ideas of what data actually matters. When we then bring into the mix um, computer scientists and IT professionals, that just um, broadens the, the um, range of different needs and different interests. And then when we also bring in the, what for convenience sake I call the general public who may range from um, other free software hackers to family historians who struggle to use their computer and trying to, such as trying to make our website usable by this vast, um, diverse range of users is something that I still find very challenging. And I think the um, translating between geeks and non-geeks is a, a challenge that we would all be familiar with. And I'm finding this both in dealing with the general public and in working with my own colleagues and employers who um, may know how to find their way around a desktop computer but don't really understand the issues behind um, open file formats, for example. Um, and people in positions like mine have a kind of identity crisis, um, or maybe I'm just being a drama queen, but um, there's a question of are we academics or are we developers or something in between or some kind of hybrid? And people c come into this work from academic backgrounds, um, such as in history or IT backgrounds, just looking at um, the two developers on founders and survivors. I'm, as I said, I studied history, but um, picked up a lot of programming along the way. The other developer who has um, been working in computers for, for longer than I've known about computers um, and has picked up a history degree along the way. So um, we're both, we both share these interests, but in terms of um, where we fit in the academic hierarchy and career progression, there's a lot of variation across the different projects that, that I've looked at. Some of us are classified as academics, some are classed as general or professional staff, and that has implications for accountability and reporting and career progression. And related to that, there's a question of whether humanities computing projects belong in academic, academic departments, say in history or in computer science, or whether they belong in sort of IT services departments, and that's also varied across the different projects that I've looked at. Um, the, the resources that we need and the way that our work is evaluated is different from traditional humanities research. We don't just need money to pay for researchers' salaries. We need to spend a lot of money on the computers as well. And where that fits in the budget line is, is some kind of mystery to me, but um, I know that it's, it's a challenge for, for our managers. Um, we may not write scholarly articles, which are the bread and butter of academics and their career progression, but we, are, um, we produce software and websites and data sets, so there's a question of how that gets evaluated in terms of academic careers and funding future projects. So it's, it's an evolving field, it's, um, it's challenging, it's difficult, it's, there's also opportunities for creativity that I, and I could have never have imagined doing work like this, it's not something that my careers counsellor ever told me would have existed. Um, and in terms of where we're going, it's, it's an evolving field, but I think what we need is more, um, more visibility for projects like these, better networking across similar projects, and these networks exist better in the UK, the United States, and Europe, um, not so visible in Australia and New Zealand, so we need to do work for, with that. And also speaking to different audience, audiences such as this, and I may also be speaking to groups of historians about, about this kind of work. So it's, it's, an, um, it's perhaps an unconventional topic for a conference like LCA, but I hope it gives you an example of the many different kinds of ways that free software can be used. Um, this, these slides will go up. There are links to the projects that I've referred to and um, some of the Australian projects, and it will be available on SlideShare.
after the break. Thank you. Any questions, anyone? I was looking at the data sets you had there just for particularly deaths of all the convicts and I was trying to think of how you could use that sort of stuff in a public health sense and do you find you get enough of the same data or to do any work you have to make it all look the same? Um, the, the, um, well there's, there's challenges, there's differences in the way that um, data was recorded over time even within the 50 years and there's the other challenge of how um, the people on our team record this data because not everyone's got the same ideas about uh, data standards. Um, I've been receiving files in Excel which um, annoys me but um, so there's there's a lot of um, data cleaning that needs to be done but we're also um, I mean the, there's a lot of questions that we could be asking. There's for example there's um, somebody in our department who's interested in the Spanish flu and so he's um, this is more related to the um, World War One data than the convicts, but um, there's interest in trying to compare the Spanish flu with um, you know, possible flu pandemics that might be emerging in the next in, in the next few years. Uh, Claudine, I, I've watched uh, my father play with Ancestry.com and generate a lot of wallpaper. <laughs> Um, just wondering, is this suitable for putting out GEDCOM files? Is this the way you get a lot of your info? Yes, that's, um, we, need, we really need to resolve the question of um, privacy, and that, you know, that's one of those never-ending questions that comes up in genealogy. But um, as I've said, I'm not fond of the GEDCOM standard, but the, it should certainly be able to, um, for the data that can be um, made available to the public. We, that is one of our considerations of exporting it into GEDCOM. And the other thing is, he's fairly dedicated, like he gets into the State Library, uh, probably fortnightly. Um, and one of the biggest challenges he finds is securing accurate data, because, uh, say, somebody in England who's a bit older isn't willing to accept there was somebody that was born out of wedlock yes, or yes. these sorts of issues. Yes. Um, ha have you worked out some way of filtering out the filters that have already been applied to your information? Yeah. Well, in a way, that, that's, I guess, that's a, a social problem rather than a technical one, which is, no, I mean, that's sort of a glib answer. Um, we're aware of those issues, and I guess uh, one of the um, things that historians learn is that you'll never have perfect data You've always got to be aware of these biases and um, simple mistakes. So it's more a question of being able to recognize where something might be hidden or we're not getting the whole truth, but we may never be able to, to really get everything. Here in New Zealand, we have a group at the National Library, the Digital NZ Project. Are you aware of the type of work they're doing? In no, I, I didn't. Think. They're sort of like acting like as a facilitator for all the different like institutions in New Zealand okay. who are digitizing content and trying to like help them work together. Yep. Okay. And I just wonder if there's any projects in Australia there. No, I didn't, same. but I'll talk to you about that. Thanks. Any more final questions? No? All right. Um, if you'd like to play, th say thank you to Claudine in the usual manner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.